It is always difficult to, to speak in the afternoon because people are half asleep, <laughs> half awake. <laughs> but uh, it is my distinguished honor to, to be part of this uh, audience. And um, let me acknowledge our guests from overseas. I was telling Helen that uh, we must connect. I want to come to Howard University, not Harvard, Howard. Yeah. OK, and um, my dear colleague uh, from TUT, hey. Uh, I see um, Professor Ramagale is gone. But uh, let me acknowledge him in, my, in his absence. And uh, the organizers of this meeting, specifically Dr. Makua, it is uh, an honor for me to be part of this gathering. I've learned so, so much uh, so far. And uh, I, I can agree that uh, when you move out, uh, uh, move from conference to conference, you're growing a bit. A, a, a little bit. So attending conferences is not a waste of time, especially conferences where there's this kind of um, engagement. OK, my focus is going to be on a responsive curriculum. I want to do some reflections on a responsive curriculum. I've seen a number of uh, abstracts or papers that are in that direction. And I want to uh, give my humble reflections on that as well. That's the University of Limpopo. I was sitting with one lady last night. I asked her whether she knows uh, where the University of Limpopo is. She says she has never been there. Uh, have you been to Polokwane? She says nothing. I've... So maybe there are a few here. When you arrive at the University of Limpopo, uh, at gate one, because there are three gates, you'll find a, a big stone, it's a mountain. And uh, the wonder of this uh, stone is that we are able to plant trees on that. There are trees on that stone. Don't tell me how. Miracles happen. <laughs> yeah, if you see, there will be some trees on that mountain. OK. And uh, how do I move now? This one. Good. Briefly, that is my outline. Start by setting the scene for a responsive curriculum. Uh, reflect on learning as a problematic construct. Move to philosophical grounding uh, for teaching and learning and talk a little bit about curriculum theory and how it should inform um, uh, teaching and learning. And uh, then go uh, do a quick track of um, some theorists who have influenced uh, curriculum thought in the century. And then pick up on two uh, philosophers, Gutare as well as uh, Deleuze, and look at uh, their concept of becoming uh, a rhizomatic or rhizomes and territorialization as a useful concept that we can use when thinking about uh, a responsive curriculum. Last but not least, I will uh, quickly visit the work of Bessel Benston on what uh, he calls competency versus performance-based curriculum, and look at uh, where the voice of the student could be in a responsive curriculum. Let me set the scene. Uh, teaching and learning in higher education uh, should be seen in the context of what has taken place in the past 10 years or 20 years. First, 
is that there's been a significant shift in the student population. In other words, the way we learned when we were students ourselves should change because universities are not as they were 20 years ago. For example, uh, age. Students who arrive at the university now, they're much younger than uh, what we used to have in the 10 years ago or 30 years ago. So they are younger. Uh, there are very few old people coming to the university now. But also, when we receive students, we have a heterogeneous groups. It's not the same um, backgrounds, like uh, from well-to-do backgrounds. So with, with the opportunities of funding, uh, we have a mixed batch of students. But also diversity. Uh, we have a mixed population now. Uh, although it's not uh, completely mixed, but we have people from different racial backgrounds, international students, etc., etc. So inclusive education uh, becomes a priority. Okay. But also, as we, we think about a responsive curriculum, we should also think about a bigger picture. Uh, for example, education now is being internationalized or internationalization of the curriculum. Um, uh, we talked about this morning about decolonizing the curriculum, but uh, internationalization is, there, is on the rise so that you are a, a world citizen. Also, in the bigger picture, there is democratization of uh, the government, gov governance, uh, free market economy. These are strong forces that the universities, if they want to be responsive, cannot ignore. They are at the center of debates. So any education that, uh, or rather any curriculum that is not uh, in one way or the other playing in this uh, platform is going to be unresponsive or ir irrelevant. But also there's a strong move now by universities to go for accountability. Uh, so they have to account for every cent that they spend and uh, at the front of this uh, debate of accountability is funding. We are funding around the FTEs uh, and SLEs. Uh, if, you, if students don't pass, you don't get money. So uh, a drive for, for throughputs is uh, in, in, in the front. I mean. Now we have summer schools, we have winter schools, we have special exams, we have agro -ted, we have supplementaries to push them to pass. Because when they pass, you get money. So that, as we play around with the curriculum, that should be, we should not forget about that, uh, that temptation or that pressure. Now let me move to the second thing is that learning uh, is usually taken as, a, is taken as, as, as something that is natural. But let me remind you, colleagues, that uh, learning has been the subject of study for many years. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, learning has been uh, the subject of debate for many years. Uh, you know about PJ, uh, Pavlov, Skinner, all those people have been engaging in what is learning and how does learning take place. So we must not be naive about the complexity of learning and think that learning is a, a simple construct, is a very complex thing. When is learning take, taking place and when is it not taking place? So, uh, 
the, the factors I've talked about in my first slide about uh, the scene, the, uh, the international scene as, the local, as well as the local scene, shows that the democratic systems uh, are, uh, are now being pushed into classrooms uh, because of uh, other factors, uh, which I'll talk about maybe later. But learning is problematic, so is teaching. Uh, some people think that teaching is just standing in front of kids or students and talking. And I say, no, it is, it, it is a science. When a teacher looks that way, it's not, it's not natural. He it, it has a science behind, he has an explanation behind that. And we as lecturers, if we think that teaching is a, a natural phenomenon, well, maybe it's a natural phenomenon, but it needs to be uh, accounted for. Uh, it must be, you must be able to say, I started by smiling, and that smiling is like a, a conductor of a choir. If you see, if you just come there and see the, the conductor moving his hands like this, if you don't know, you may think that he's joking. But that is a language. He knows when he's doing this. So is teaching. It's not as a, simple as just standing in front of people and talking. And I think that my lecturers, when I was at the university, they, they were just standing there and talking. And whether their talking was informed by some theory, I don't know. But if we want our curriculum to be responsive, we need to take cognizance of that fact. Okay. Now, because of uh, uh, other forces like uh, international aid agencies. I mean, they play a role. Although we are uh, in a classroom or in a lecture hall and we're not conscious of these things, but international funding agencies uh, uh, fund in such a way that you teach in a particular way. And one of, of those um, uh, views of, of curriculum is what I would call the technicist view of education. In other words, education must just produce. Uh, it's like you put input, throughput, input, throughput. So the, the emphasis is, uh, is very techni technical in a way. And there's also a push uh, uh, in the past decade or so, a push for learner-centered pedagogy. But that push of learner-centered pedagogy is, is driven by international agencies because they, they are driven by democratization of education. So those, those we must be conscious of these as we enter the classroom. That uh, we, there are other uh, forces behind uh, what we are doing. Okay, now the last bullet there, I want us to look at it. Focus in most uh, universities is on the cognitive development, academic skills, uh, rather than on economic and political uh, factors. And I think uh, speakers before me have shown how education is not just about academic skills and so on and so forth. That it, it is a political text, curriculum is a political text, there are economics involved in this and so forth. So uh, this makes teaching complex. It's not just talking, because you are playing in a den of lions uh, in that classroom, which you are not aware of. So we need to be aware if we are to be responsive. Now, also, uh, it is important to see the role of theory. Uh, Joey asked a question uh, long, long ago. He says, what knowledge is of most worth? You know Joey, John Joey. What knowledge is of most worth? So these questions are very important for us as curriculum uh, uh, deliverers or, or students or professors uh, to understand uh, what knowledge, why do we teach this? I mean, 
decolonization will say, why do we choose this, te uh, this text and not that text? Why do we, why do we teach about um, uh, Jan van Riebeck and not about um, Nelson Mandela? Which texts come into the, into the picture? And why do we prescribe this textbook and not th that textbook? So when we think about teaching from that angle, uh, how we choose our texts, how we, the way we teach, and so on and so forth, these are very, very important questions. Uh, understanding how, what knowledge we should teach and how we should teach it underlies then uh, the role of a teacher. What is my role in the classroom? Okay? What is my role and the role of the student? Where does the student come in knowledge production? Is knowledge delivered like a milk or bread at the door, we collect it and we deliver it or transmit it to students, or do we create knowledge in our classrooms? So these are the questions which are very, very important if you are to understand a responsive curriculum. There are, there are, there are three the uh, theorists uh, uh, in curriculum studies that have influenced the field of curriculum studies and uh, I just want to, to share, because our, most of our teaching, as I see it in our universities, is uh, uh, influenced by these uh, scholars. Raf Tyler, whom we can call the father of curriculum studies, uh, an American, uh, Helen, uh, is of the view that curriculum should be organized around objectives. And I think that's where outcomes-based education grow from. And these, his ideas have influenced many, many uh, educators and educationists uh, in, the, in, in the past centuries. Uh, if you look at the uh, Bloom's taxonomy, which is used uh, very predominantly, it has its roots from Tyler. Okay, without giving a lecture, I want to go to the highlighted part. And this is very important for us to understand curriculum as a responsive uh, uh, text. Uh, document. He, this approach is regarded as looking at curriculum when we, th when we talk about curriculum, many people are located into looking at it as a document. And this is a popular view amongst many people. Whenever they think of a curriculum, they think of a document or a list of courses or a list of content to be taught to students. And this kind of thinking then influences their practice in their classroom. Okay, uh, that's uh, uh, Ralph Tyler, the great man. The second uh, philosopher who has influenced the field of education or curriculum studies pre, uh, uh, preeminently is Stenhouse, Lawrence Stenhouse. Lawrence Stenhouse uh, views curriculum as a process. He says it's not a document. The real curriculum is what takes place in the classroom. So when teachers and students interact with the content, that interaction and this kind of view thinks of curriculum as bigger than just a document that is uh, given, but it looks at methods of teaching that curriculum, the classroom setup, the assessment that are going with that, and we talk about curriculum in a broader sense. Tyler is regarded as a, a person who talks about curriculum in a narrow sense. Lawrence is taken as a, a person who speaks of curriculum in a broader sense. And it is in this view that I am subscribing. I'm a member of this view of curriculum because this is the only hopeful route to making curriculum responsive if you are to make it responsive. If the teacher, in the, in the in Tyler's view of curriculum, the teacher, the teacher is taken 
is taken off the or is, is, is relegated to the level of a deliverer or a transmitter of information. But in this view, the lecturer or the teacher is part of uh, the debate, or he, he, he creates or she creates uh, knowledge. Now, the third one, which has also influenced educational thought, uh, which we cannot do any responsive curriculum without studying, is Paulo Freire. Uh, his famous book is called The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which every teacher should read, especially uh, in institutions like ourselves, previously disadvantaged uh, common, uh, universities. According to him, society and the student are very, very important. When you are in the classroom, you mustn't just think about uh, that accounting or that mathematics, Raj, but you must think about the society, a bigger society out there. And to him, uh, uh, the, the, the principal, the deputy vice chancellor said it this morning that education is the only hope we have. So teachers, if they are conscious that they are the agents of change, the catalyst of change, then uh, Paul Freire is the way to go. Now, <clears throat> I want to move out of uh, the philosophers who have given us some framework to work within. That is Tyler, uh, that is Lawrence uh, uh, Stenhouse, and that's Paul Freire, these main scholars. But recently, there have been new uh, vistas into how to think about a responsive curriculum. And one of these is uh, Catherine, uh, Catherine Conbleth, who has written uh, some work in 1990, 91, 95. If you Google, you'll find the work of uh, Catherine. And what I like about uh, Catherine, he says curriculum, I like the, the definition of what curriculum is, which uh, gives us a leeway into looking at um, a, a responsive curriculum. She says curriculum is a contextualized social process. And that is too loaded. Curriculum is a contextualized social process. I've highlighted two, two, two concepts there that are very important in, his, in her uh, analogy of the curriculum. It says social conditions in which students find themselves outside the school are very, very important as we couple with issues of how to teach, how to assess. Once we decontextualize education and treat it as a science, you know, a fundamental, fundamental pedagogies, uh, uh, pedagogy, you remember it, was saying you bracket everything because education is a science. And this view is as education, well, it's a science in a way, but it cannot detach itself from the context in which students find themselves. That's our sister, uh, Catherine. Now, I want to turn my attention to the, uh, the two guys I told you about, which I think provide a, a beautiful conceptual framework to think about curriculum as a, a responsive curriculum. Uh, these two are Felix Goudari. He just died recently. There are three concepts that I want us to quickly look at, uh, which could help us. The first is becoming, although I didn't put them in that order there. Okay. But the second is assemblage. And the third is a rhizome. Now, if I were to read uh, verbatim, becoming is creating concepts in ways, in, in ways which are fluid and open where closure and working with fixed approach to meaning and knowledge are avoided. Uh, hope is not going to extreme relativism, but 
this is a very important uh, concept to think. He says we should look at classroom situation as places of becoming. People always changing. Uh, let me give an, a, 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 down, a, a, mother, a down to earth example. I'll see. If my notes, which I used in 1984 to teach, I teach the same notes and the paper has even changed the color, I rely on these notes. There is no dynamism, there's no becoming. So these notes are relevant now. In my next lecture, they may be irrelevant. And then I am becoming. The, the classroom situation is always. I'm not, whether, I'm not sure whether, whether this is uh, uh, relevant uh, to mathematics. <laughs> yeah. But if the content remains the same, then the, the pedagogy must change because the student composition is different, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, now I like this fluidness. Yeah. Okay, but go on and, and look at, uh, oh, sorry. When it comes to teaching, I'm giving an example there. there this, these two guys, um, Gudari, Felix Gudari and Gilix Dulles, have, Dulles, have written a, a voluminous book, I think some of you have seen it. It's called A, a Thousand Plateaus about, a, about a 700 pages or 800 pages. Very difficult to read. But if you read it again and again, it becomes very uh, useful to thinking about curriculum in this way. Now, he says, when it comes to teaching and learning, for, for, for instance, teaching and learning should be allowed to be fluid, to be experimental, to be transgressive, I like that transgressive. In other words, you transgress boundaries, areas. Okay, now in my honors class, I had an honors class uh, this week, earlier this week. I told them uh, they, they are used to people talking. And I've adopted a philosophy that says, don't, don't teach, let them do something. So from that philosophy, when I entered the classroom, I, I, put, the, I put the topic on the, on, the, on the PowerPoint, and I said, okay, this is, you're writing a test on this. They said, what? Because I was transgressing the normal rules that you must teach and give an exam. But if they create knowledge, they should start, and then, and you'll be amazed how students know more than we think they know when we move from that angle. We put a topic and say, okay, I just say, write 10 lines about what you think about uh, 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 evaluation uh, in the context of uh, Stenhouse. And they write, and I read, and I correct. But in that way, I've transgressed the rules of the game, and the rules of the game are stand up, talk, and evaluate thereafter. I want to uh, look at um, whether this is, a, is applicable, but the, the aim of education should be to transform us. Somebody was asked a question, what, what, what can you uh, define, how can we define education? What is education? And I like this definition. It says, education is what remains in you after you've forgotten everything that you have learned at school. Food for thought. Okay. Now, let, let's look at the, that cycle. If we could, we are, at the beginning, we are like an egg a circle of a butterfly. Then, uh, then you move, you are a caterpillar, and then uh, you are a chrysalis, then you are a butterfly. So, both the teacher and the student should always go through cycles 
circles of changing all the time, changing our image, changing our identity. I mean, that's where, when education becomes education, uh, when you've forgotten about all that you've been taught at school, there remains in you what we call education. Now, if I were to take assemblages, moving away from becoming assemblages, they talk about uh, lines of flight. Uh, if we look at uh, the wolves there, they always go in groups. And this is the analogy of how a curriculum that is responsive should be like. There's a time when we should follow the lines. We should be together, uh, cover each other, or work within the frames, work within the, the boundaries and the territories. Okay, now, for change to happen, if education becomes education, what happens is only that I don't have a, another picture there for the wolves. What they do, the wolves, one of them will break the, will break the ranks and go alone into a different direction. I guess you are acquainted with that. I'm not sure whether America, you have the wolves there, Helen. Okay, but they break the, the lengths and it, it goes alone into a different direction. And thereafter, the others follow suit and they form a new assemblage. Now, if we use this, uh, we realize that there are times when we, we, we crystallize or maybe we fossilize knowledge and we put a ceiling and say, this is what is known in this area. Now, if our, we are teaching in a responsive fashion, we need to have minds, could be the students or the lecturer, who could refute what is accepted, what's normative, what's standard, and move out of the standard into a new direction. And when you do that, you create knowledge. I like this uh, uh, story of assemblages and uh, lines of flight, moving uh, different from the, the rest. Now, think about Galileo Galilei, who, against the, uh, the, the norm of the time, said that the world is not uh, flat, but is round. What happened to him? Huh? He was killed. Am I right? He was killed. He was giving a divergent view. So the problem with our education is that all the time we want conformity, we want to walk in the ranks, we want to walk together, and there are few who are breaking the lines and forming new assemblages. Another, uh, how much time do I have? <laughs> oh, okay, it's all right, we'll, I'll finish now. Another concept um, that um, uh, Gudari and uh, Deleuze use is uh, that of a rhizome. A rhizome, um, rhizome um, plants, there are a number of bananas, I think you, it's one of them, I don't know which one. Yeah, a fig tree also is a rhizome. They have, they have roots that grow underneath and move and uh, shoot out at different times. You don't have to plant another one. As it grows, another one somewhere, it will shoot out. And that's a rhizome. You think it is dead, it's not dead. It's gonna come out somewhere. Now he says education should be in a form of a rhizome. Uh, somebody was trying to think about a rhizomatic type of uh, pedagogy. Allowing, because at the, at the center of that is that it is complex. And if teaching, learning and teaching situations should be regarded as complex, that we have different minds, uh, different backgrounds, different feelings, etc., then we should know that it is complex and it is ever-changing. Once our education has, has, has fossilized, it has uh, crystallized, it has, it has become hard, it cannot change, 
it is going to fail to be responsive. Because I was telling my students, they said, what I'm teaching here may be irrelevant in the coming year. The textbook that I'm here, having here, maybe is already absolute in the coming year. That's how dynamic life is. And if curriculum is to follow or to give the way, it should be rhizomatic. Yeah. Let me end up with a student uh, voice. And I'm asking a question, what is the place of students in our lecture halls? As I pass to my lecture room on the second floor, and I, I pass colleagues uh, on the corridor in their classes, I always ask myself, is teaching, is teaching, a, is learning going on there? You know, what is my, my intelligent guess? There's no learning there. But I may be wrong. Students are sitting still, like in a conference like this one, <laughs> listening. And the teacher is doing 90% of the talking. He thinks that is clever, cleverer than those uh, 50 minds. It's not possible. So. Here's a picture of a young man facing a debate with a teacher. And I think teachers get impatient because they have a pace set us. They want to finish the syllabus. They said, no, you're wasting our time. Can we move on, please? We have a syllabus to finish. We have the exam to write. And that stifles debate. And students get into a mode, what we'll call the computer, a sleepy mode and then wait until you say yes, and then it comes up. OK, so uh, I'm arguing that uh, a responsive curriculum should be the one that is competency-based. But what I'm not sure now is whether I will be able to satisfy uh, the deadlines of the head of the department who wants the, who wants the marks and so on and so forth if we pursue this line. So I'm caught up there in between. But uh, uh, the concept of a competency-based curriculum versus a performance-based curriculum is a concept coined by Basil uh, Bernstein, of whom you may be uh, uh, aware of, code and classifications of knowledge. Now, Bernstein talks about two types of curricula. The first he calls the competency-based. The competency-based uh, argues that the student's abilities should be the one that informs the curriculum. How I teach, how I pace my teaching, how I assess, that should be driven from a student perspective. Performance-based, on the other hand, is uh, performance-based, or, or rather is, um, is outside-driven, is teacher-driven. The teacher has a ready-made menu, he gives it to you. It's a one-size-fits-all, uh, regardless of the, I can't see from a distance, okay. Regardless of the learning styles of the learners. The teacher comes, he, he prefers a particular learning style or teaching style, and he imposes or superimposes on students and students have no say. The performance-based is exam-driven. Like certain high schools, right at the beginning of the year, they teach the question papers. And in that school, there are a few who are examiners of subjects. So, okay, it's January. Open question paper, 1994. And then they take all the question papers by the end of the year, they have finished all the question papers, and they pass in distinctions, I must tell you. But most of them fail when they go to universities, because certain competences or attributes have not been grinded enough in the students. Now, 
Bernstein also goes to talk about what he calls school knowledge versus everyday knowledge. Now, if our curriculum is to be responsive, we should move into bridging the gap between everyday knowledge and school knowledge. At the moment, there's a gap. And I give an illustration to my students. I say, when I was doing, uh, a, that was standard two, I don't know what it is great for. Yeah, there. In the class, we were given a task to write a telegram. And then I got, I think, eight or nine, nine out of 10. And then about two weeks or so thereafter, my mother sent me to the post office to write a telegram. Guess what? I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. So my school knowledge and my everyday knowledge were not speaking from one voice. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience.